and welcome to the conclusion of Segal Month on Bad Movie Beatdown. This week we're going back in time to visit Half Past Dead. Half Past Dead marks an important moment in Segal's career. It was his last theatrical release in 2002 before he was consigned to a director DVD grave. It would be eight years before he appeared on the silver screen again in Machete. The film is clearly positioned to expand upon Segal's position in the gangster action genre after his stuttering career was revived by his team up with DMX in Exit Wounds by aiming it at a younger audience. It teams him up with another rapper come actor in the form of Ja Rule and is the only Seagal movie to receive a PG-13 rating. The script for the film was apparently written at the same time as similar Alcatraz action of The Rock and was shelved for several years. It should have stayed shelved. Let's take a look at Half Past Dead and why it effectively killed Seagal's career. Signs are not encouraging for mere seconds in. Don't keep on dropping this file. Then we jump off to this gangster shit. That's right, because this movie is PG-13, we can't even open with the uncensored versions of the hip-hop songs on the film's soundtrack. This is gonna suck. Oh, and we began with franchise pictures, and we end on franchise pictures. A fitting conclusion to Seagal months, considering this production company sank like Seagal's career. So the film opens with Nick, played by Ja Rule, taking some gangsters up to visit Seagal, who they don't trust for obvious reasons. All throughout these opening few minutes, the titles slide across the screen for no apparent reason. And no, this is not how they reveal the title, because they do that several minutes later. Guys, it's really distracting! I already know what movie I'm watching! They visit Seagal in his apartment, and because someone has been speaking to the feds, they give him a polygraph test. Sasha. Petrosevich. You're Russian? Yeah, I'm Russian. Good to see he's attempting the accent. You work for any law enforcement agencies? Sometimes, you know, I work for the CIA, for the KGB, do a little bit of something for the uh, East German Stasi. You left out the FBI. Are you FBI? I boost cars. That's all. Oh, come on. It's blatantly obvious that he's an FBI agent. He always plays a federal agent. And why would he be hanging out with Ja Rule, who is half his age? With a knife at his throat, Seagal manages to convince them that he is not an FBI agent and join their syndicate. Of course, if he was an FBI agent, and I'm just spitballing here, I think he knows ways of fooling a simple polygraph. So Seagal and Nick are sent to steal cars because Gone in 60 Seconds was really popular, and Seagal does this in the most overblown fashion he can, with no degree of subtlety or restraint. <laughs> Yep, showing off like that won't get yourselves killed. And can the editor please calm the hell down? How long we know each other? About two years, two and a half years. I've been asking you to call me Nick. I like Nicholas, all right? No, well, it's not all right. It's I. Right. I love Nicholas, all right? I. Right. Ugh, watching Seagal try and get down to the streets is like watching your dad try to dance. It's just embarrassing for everyone involved. Seagal continues to show off when he gets to the drop off. <laughs> oh my god, that was so stupid. <laughs> I'ma kick your ass one day. Yeah, you dick! You just broke my spine in a car windshield! We're not alright, man! But this meeting is broken up by the arrival of the FBI. Unfortunately, Nick is an idiot, and despite being vastly outnumbered, he and the warehouse open fire on the FBI with inevitable results. <laughs> Okay, let's be fair, that is something you need a stunt double for, as opposed to walking. Seagal jumps in the way of some shots fired at Nick, saving Nick's life but killing Seagal. Wait, hang on? Am I reading that correctly? Seagal dies? I mean, it's very rare that Seagal dies in his movies. His ego doesn't allow it. I mean, he apparently walked off set because he didn't want to die an executive decision, and the way he dies in Machete is one where he technically killed himself. Could it be that the Ponytail 1 has expired? No, of course not. You thought Half Past Dead was a dumb title? Well, it is, but there's a reason for it. Seagal has arrived from the clutches of death 22 minutes after he passed away, thus he is... Ugh, half Past Dead. 
God, that even hurt to say. But Sagao's fine and certainly doesn't have any brain damage from being clinically dead for so long because eight months later he reunites with Nick as they are about to enter the new Alcatraz, which has reopened for business. Sagao goes through the metal detector, which is set off. It's my leg. What are you packing? This. Why are you starting a fight? What does that accomplish besides a pointless action scene? And Nick promptly jumps into his friend's aid, which results in him being thrown around like a rag doll. Is Jeru made out of metal or something? And where are the guards with the guns? Prisoners are making a disturbance, shoot them! The tough warden, played by Tony Plana, comes down to break up the fight. What you bringing into my island, you see? My knee. It's titanium. Which one? Left. What is the point of giving Sagao a metal knee? What purpose does that serve besides as a pointless explanation for why Sagao can't move as fast as he used to? This new Alcatraz is meant to be a tough answer to the more violent criminals of today's generation. It's state of the art and ruthlessly guarded, which is why we see prisoners playing PlayStation and painting the walls. Yeah, I kind of expected the toughest prison in the country to be a bit harsher than this. To set an example and mark the opening of Alcatraz, they're having fireworks of a sort. Lester McKenna is going to be executed for the robbery of $200 million in gold, which he had hidden, never to divulge where he put it. The judge who sentenced him, now the Supreme Court Justice, has arrived on the island to witness the execution at midnight. The warden asks her men to hand in their guns. Don't worry, I'm sure a bunch of thieves won't break into the prison tonight. Sure enough, there are some thieves, and I would like to know how how long it took them to parachute down to the prison considering they jump off the plane at sunset and it's night by the time they land. Hell, another scene occurs in the time it takes for them to land. Did they jump through a rip in the space-time continuum? Lester wants to see Seagal, so he is taken to see him. Lester wants to talk about what it's like at the end. And bloomin' heck, this prison is awfully nice. They not only allow Lester to choose from five different ways of execution, but he gets to stare at a computer view as he waits. Blimey, this is nicer than some of the hotels I've stayed at. Who says crime doesn't pay? Well, besides the death part. Don't you want to know why I'm sitting in that chair tonight? I hit a United States money train and ripped off 200 million worth of U.S. gold brick. You must have done more than that. The train got accidentally derailed and five U.S. Treasury agents got killed. Yeah, as it turns out, it wasn't as easy as when Woody Housen did it in Money Train. These criminals soon knock out the phone lines and take over the prison with ease, considering this is meant to be an unrelenting super prison. They're headed up by Donald, played by Morris Chestnut, who apparently works for the government given he was there when the prison opened. And no, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, we have to show how ruthless these bad guys are. Anybody hit? Seven's down. He's your man. Sleep tight, friend. Wait, back up a second! That guy just turned his head! He's supposed to be dead! How do you miss something like that? It's almost time for the execution and the head guard takes Seagal back to his cell. Apparently none of the guards use their radios about the terrorists breaking in. What the hell? Well, that wasn't clearly edited for the PG-13. And in the most stunning of implausibilities, not only did Seagal survive, but they don't double check to make sure that he's dead. But that's nothing compared to what happens next. Seagal <sighs> just used a taser as a defibrillator. Never mind the fact that the guard was shot in the chest with a machine gun, and it was! They also set the prisoners free, even though it's completely unnecessary to their plan. Oh, yeah, that guy's dead. Elsewhere, the terrorists prove just how airtight their plan is by planning their escape by helicopter in the middle of a heavy storm. The pilot crashes into a lighthouse that just happened to be struck by lightning earlier so he couldn't see it, causing the helicopter to get stuck in the ceiling of the prison. I think we just lost our ride. Why is she smiling? You have no exit strategy now, you dumbasses! It turns out that Donald's entire reason for breaking into this prison is a last-ditch effort for him to try and get Lester's hidden gold. Are you going to take me to the gold, yes or no? Yes or no? Super 
And again, that was clearly edited. I feel like I'm watching a TV version. 49 or 6, played by Nia Peoples with far too much eye makeup, spots Seagal trying to escape with the guard. Talk about a delayed reaction, woman! He could have blown your head off! She sends her men after him, and Sagao is seen patching up a bullet wound in the infirmary that we never saw him get. The bad guys follow him there, and a clearly compromised action sequence ensues, with bad guys dying in unusually fatal ways. Did I mention that we're halfway through the movie, and it's only now Sagao's first fight scene? being kicked into a cabinet was enough to kill someone. If that was the case, Jar Wall should have been dead ages ago. I have a feeling a neck break might have been cut out somewhere. Six bumps into Seagal running around the prison. Easy now. I'm just looking for my men. They're all dead. Dead? They all look like they've been knocked out. There was nothing fatal about that last sequence. Via sloppy airting, Six jumps down the ropes attached to the helicopter down to the lower level, with Nick picking up the gun she kicked out of Seagal's hand, and a gunfight ensues, somehow opening up a door in the floor leading to the basement. Nick manages to have her cornered, but instead of, I don't know, shooting her, he opts for hand-to-hand combat because he's a dumbass, and she promptly escapes before Seagal arrives. Although I have to admit that Jar Wall getting his ass handed to him by a woman is very satisfying. The FBI are now in charge of stopping the bad guys. What you got, Captain? Coast Guard reports the helicopter went down around 7.30. Nice continuity, guys. The helicopter crashed around midnight when the execution was meant to happen. Donald calls them with his mobile phone to demand they get him a helicopter and a means of escape, or he will execute the Supreme Court Justice on the chair. Meanwhile, Seagal's double climbs up to the helicopter to use its radio. Sasha, is that you? Tell me, how does the FBI's finest shoot one of her best undercover agents? I don't have time for this discussion. I've got some wingnut saying he's going to waste the United States Supreme Court justice. You would have thought that in the last eight months they would have found something else to talk about. And yes, to the surprise of absolutely no one, Seagal has been an undercover agent all this time. Find out who the cell phone's registered to. I want to know who I'm up against. Computer should be printing it out now. Donald Robert Johnson. Served in Kuwait and Bosnia, three tours all together. Says he suffers from the Gulf War Syndrome. Last 18 months, he's been working a desk at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. What a brilliant mastermind Don is, making ransom demands to the FBI on his own cell phone! God, I don't even think Seagal needs to stop him. He can do it content all by himself! Twitch, played by Corrupt, gets a rocket launcher, and Seagal orders him to fire it, resulting in a hilarious scene of him being blasted through a window as he blasts the door, locking them in. Why does this person have a rocket launcher? No, better question, where did they get this rocket launcher from, considering they can't go anywhere? So the prisoners burst into the armory and weapon themselves against the terrorists. Meanwhile, this movie needs some more padding, so let's have Morris Chestnut do some random psycho shit to the Supreme Court Justice. Why have you never been married? No one ever asked me. Too busy burning bras, huh? You forgot about love, didn't you? Then your biological clock stopped ticking. Your feels went fallow. And now, in the autumn of your historic life, you ain't got nothing. Essentially, what this scene boils down to is Morris Chestnut pointing at a woman and going, Ha ha! You had the menopause! Can we get that to Seagal, please? And right on cue, Seagal shows up with a body that can still drop its arms and pretty much manages to incapacitate everyone with ease, managing to get Lester free in the process. He tries to rescue the Supreme Court Justice, but he is unable to in time. Donald and his men chase after Seagal, leading to some fighting in the boiler room. Yep, Seagal wasn't even doing his own fighting in his last theatrically released movie. His days were clearly numbered. Seagal's double then attacks Don whilst they fire each other while swinging on chains. Whee! Eventually, Seagal and Donald go down to the ground where Seagal does his best Dirty Harry impression. Your clip's dry, 1137. You know it. That's right. Question is, do I still have one in the tube? Make your move. Sweet dream, bud. You know your career as an action star has hit a serious low point when you have to be bailed out by Jar freaking rule. Nick gets the impression that Seagal hasn't been telling him everything. Are you hiding something from me? It's 
Nothing. Trying to save the life of a Supreme Court Justice. There's more. Yeah, why would a convicted criminal try and save the Supreme Court Justice? It doesn't make sense, man! FBI. But you passed the lie detector test. That's nothing, man. Anybody can do that. All this time, you've been setting up on me. I'm sorry. Oh, poor Ja Rule. I love the terrible acting by Ja Rule in this scene. He looks like a lost, wounded puppy who has no idea how to convey the emotion in this scene. It's hilarious. The FBI gives Donald a helicopter, but he still needs Lester. Segal makes Donald an offer. He will swap for the Supreme Court Justice for Lester, telling him to meet him in the cell block. Lester tells Segal about the location of the gold in a scene that seems a bit familiar to me. I want to tell you about a place I used to go. It's an alpine lake called Trinity. There's a little cove on the north bank. It's tucked away. You should take a trip there when this is all over. If you fancy a journey, I recommend Fort Walton, Kansas. Is this what I think it is? Afterwards, Seagal goes up into the helicopter where Nick joins him and we can have more emotional revelations. I want Sonny that bad, huh? My wife's dead because of him. She died after one of his men jacked my car and put four bullets in her chest. I'm sorry, man. I didn't know. I don't know. She was the best part of me. And that was the end of the scene. We don't want Seagal to act too hard. Meanwhile, Donald and his men come for Lester. Just because you slow-mo the shots, guys, doesn't mean we can't notice when you recycle them. They arrive and make the exchange, which is played up in slow motion because the director seems to think he's John Woo. I had to fast forward it to get them across the room it was taking so bloody long. You did good. Now give up your guns, or two things can happen. You get killed, or you get caught. Comprending? They kept their word, now let's keep ours. Comprendate it! Oh, nice going, Twitch! Now everyone is going to die because you tried to be a badass! Congratulations! That said, maybe Segal's plan is rather flawed in the fact that he gave machine guns to a bunch of maximum security prisoners who generally don't respond well to orders I found. As the prisoners fight the terrorists, the FBI go to pick up the Supreme Court Justice using footage lifted, ironically enough, from The Rock. for the PG-13 is really fucking obvious. Seagal spends most of this action sequence above the action, barely doing anything, but that changes when the bad guys start firing at the helicopter, forcing him to jump out. Hurrah! <laughs> Jarvel is dead! Or at least seriously injured! So it looks like Seagal is cornered once again when the FBI, via the power of miracles, manages to burst into the building at the right moments with incredible speed and Donald escapes. I never get tired of those cliché shoot when the villain has a weapon scenes. Seagal goes to check in on Nick in the crashed helicopter. Can we get him? Yeah, we got him. Yo, I'm gonna miss you, Sars. Don't say that, man. It's a nice night to die. Let's just hang in there and we'll get you out of here. Seagal, I know it's hard, but could you try to act just a little bit more concerned? Sasha. That's not McPherson. Oh, what bullshit! Yes, it wasn't actually her, it was a random hostage, which was why she was shot from behind the entire time, even though Ja Rule would have clearly seen that on his scope. Glad to see lots of people die for absolutely no reason. So Seagal and the FBI go after Donald, who is trying to fly away in his helicopter. He throws out the Supreme Court Justice, and in a painfully preposterous climax, Seagal dives after her. Well, his extremely obvious stunt double anyways. Seagal needed a double to do fight scenes. I can imagine he shat himself at the prospect of jumping out of a helicopter. It didn't work for Arnold in a razor, and it certainly doesn't work for you, Seagal. Donald discovers to his horror that Lester is wearing a bomb, blowing him up in the helicopter. Wow, Seagal didn't actually take out the main villain. That's surprising. But then again, he didn't do much of anything in this movie anyways. So Seagal, who apparently forgot to put on his head, Hair dye that day goes to the location of the gold and digs it up. But there is still one last thing to deal with as Seagal meets up with Nick, who is recuperating in prison. I heard you busted Sonny Eggbo. 
That's what I started out to do. I usually like to finish what I start. Good to see the resolution to that plot line was off screen. I was truly invested in Seagal's revenge for a wife we didn't even know. Seagal tells Nick that he had the Supreme Court Justice look at his file and that he is going to be set free to Nick's delight. Do we have issues? Are we all right? Hell no, we ain't all right. We are. Truly up there with Casablanca as one of the most memorable closing lines of any movie. Except, unfortunately, they're not the final lines. Because you want to see more of Twitch, right? And what we used to do back in the days, the little... Ah, there it goes! Wiggling folks! Don't make me go old school with you. Because Lord knows, if there's one thing this movie needed, it's Monique. Half Past Dead is not a particularly good movie. Seagal is still out of shape despite it being his last theatrical outing, hence he often wears loose clothing. The film is compromised on every level to achieve the PG-13 rating, and the end result is a film that wastes even Seagal. If you can't get him to break some limbs and necks, then what is the point of having him in the first place? It doesn't even use the Alcatraz setting properly. You could have set it in any other prison and it wouldn't have made a difference. This is just a really shitty die-hard in a prison clone. There is a reason that Seagal's career tanked, and that's because people aren't stupid enough to pay cinema prices to see this crap. So what's Seagal up to these days? Well, he did make a return to the silver screen with Machete, where he played, uncharacteristically, a bad guy. In fact, it shows that if he wanted to, Steven could reinvent his tired old image, even if he did spend most of that film on computer screens. Sadly, his ego will prevent that from happening. Perhaps that's why Seagal was last seen starring in Australian big commercials in a short film called Sheep Impact. This says it all about Seagal. He's become his own self-parody. That's just sad. You know what else is sad? They actually made a sequel. Yep, that's right folks. So stay tuned. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad Seagal movies everywhere. <laughs>